LBIC is a community being transformed by the love of Jesus, sharing this love with all people. Our desire is for this online video, featuring part of our Sunday gathering as well as the weekly message, to provide a personal connection and an opportunity to hear familiar voices in this unique time when not everyone can gather in person. So enjoy the service. We're grateful to have you join us as a part of the LBIC family. Outdoor service, welcome uh, to being together in the presence of God. Um, we hope that you meet him in a special way this morning. And I invite you to stand. The words that we will sing, the songs are on the, the sheet. Hopefully you have a sheet. It's a full sheet. Uh, we're starting with strong God. Our, strong, our God is a mighty God, a strong God, an awesome God. We're going to praise him this morning. Let's sing together.
grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, and where
Amen. Hey there, LBIC family and those of you who are joining us online. It's uh, good to be with you again here today. Uh, before we dive into the scripture today, which is going to be Romans 14, uh, verses 1 through 12, just wanted to share a little bit pastorally of my heart with you all. Some of you I haven't seen in quite a while since COVID and things have happened. And um, just wanted to share my heart, which today is a, a bit heavy um, because there's just so much going on. Uh, and for me, pastorally, one of, uh, if not my main concern as a pastor has been how, how do I pastor and how do I help us as a, as a church community, as a family, uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ? How do I help us follow Jesus through, through this time and this season? And the hard thing for me as a pastor is that this season is incredibly complex. So there are some big things that are happening, and the list kind of just seems to be getting bigger um, with the pandemic and um, injustice issues and wildfires and um, just all these big things. But then we have things that are going on in our personal lives too, and so it, it feels like this weight is compounding. And pastorally, I'm, I, I'm like, I just... I don't know how to speak into all of these things, but continually just trust uh, that the Spirit uh, is speaking to us and is speaking in your life um, and helping you and helping us navigate these these really difficult times. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, I, I hope that in the midst of all of the things that are going on that... Um, that you are sensing God's spirit and presence among you, uh, that you're experiencing the strength and the grace of God uh, in, in your life each day, that you're receiving God's wisdom and how to live in these, in these times in ways that continue to point us and orient us towards Jesus and also express um, the life and the love of Jesus in, in our world. So, yeah, just... Just to say that at the beginning, um, I really hope our times together uh, are encouraging um, and, and encourage one another to continue in the Jesus in the Jesus way. So with that, uh, let's just look at Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through through 12 today. Uh, this is a passage that Paul writes to the Roman church as he's trying to help two different groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, uh, reconcile with one another and learn how to, to be the church together. And uh, if you've been a part of the church for any length of time, you, you know that being the body of Christ together isn't always easy. It's not always easy, and especially when you bring groups of people as different as Jews and Gentiles together, the complexity is, is even greater. When you bring two groups of people or even two people that have such different understandings or experiences or perspectives uh, and, and bring them together and try to form one body. And the Roman church is not just one church, it's many churches throughout Rome, but nonetheless, when you bring two groups of people that have such different experiences and backgrounds together, it can be complicated. And, and one of the things is, is I've been in a church most of my, my life, and I've been in ministry for 20 years, and uh, I'd like to think that I've grown in my faith and, and walking with Christ over, over the years. One of the things that, that I've noticed is just how easy it is to judge other brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it's very easy to judge either their theology or their uh, experience or their practice or, or any of those kinds of things. Um, it's easy because there's so much that we could disagree about um, biblical interpretation and theology and culture and church structure and what is important, what's not important, social issues, and then we have our personalities and then we have different experiences of faith and all that kind of stuff. And so it's very easy for us as brothers and sisters uh, in Christ to judge one another. Um, those have been the, the worst parts of myself or the worst parts of um, my experience of, of the body of Christ. On the other hand, one of the sweetest things that I've experienced uh, over the course of my life is the fellowship 
um, that I experience within the body, uh, particularly as I've been with people who are very different than me, who bring different perspectives and we, we bring different backgrounds or different theological understandings and all this. And, and I've experienced this in my, in my doctoral program here the last couple of years. You know, 16 people, students who come from very different places and, and philosophies of ministry and all that kind of stuff. And, and you get to spend time with these folks and the barriers begin to, to fall down. Uh, you begin to open up about your brokenness and your humanity. You become to, uh, you you come to become vulnerable with one another, and in the end, you understand uh, the desire uh, and the need that each one of us in the group uh, have have for God. And the most sweet and beautiful thing is to bring each other before the Lord and and to bring our lives and the things that we're going through before God. And so uh, Paul's passage that he writes here is one that's kind of confronting the judgment that's happening between Jews and Gentiles. And frankly, I think in our, our, our time, um, maybe it's amplified, maybe it's not, but it does feel like uh, the judgments that Christians have towards one another, that we have towards our brothers and sisters of, in Christ, um, are, are pretty pronounced. Um, and I'll, I'll confess too, um, that I've been a part of that uh, and that uh, it's easy for me to be able to hop on the judgment wagon. But as I'm given this scripture this week to deal with, maybe I ought to just start with um, a spirit of repentance and, and just repent for the ways that I have judged other, other followers of Jesus um, just because I don't understand, because I can't comprehend. Um, I, I've, I've certainly, uh, in my heart, maybe not have expressed it all the time, but in my heart have let things, uh, walls get built up between me and others, either closely or from a distance, um, just because uh, of my judgmentalism towards, towards our differences. And so Paul writes into this today, and I think, uh, I think it's a very timely thing for us to read and consider together today. So let's look at Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. You can just listen as I read. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. Once person, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Just sit with that one for a bit. Verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so as to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we are living, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account to God. Let's just talk a little bit about the situation that Paul is writing into. As I said before, the Roman church is primarily made up of Gentile or Roman Christians. However, it was founded by Jewish believers. And so what you have is Jewish believers who have the history and practice of Judaism 
converting to Christianity, but then carrying over some of those practices because for millennia, they have been ways that the Jewish people have expressed their faith and faithfulness to God. Uh, and so they carry some of those things with them. So uh, it, it is not uncommon within the early church for Jewish Christians to continue to eat kosher or Jewish Christians to continue to observe Sabbath. Uh, in fact, within the Gentile world, those were things that made them stand out and made them different. And so you have these Jewish uh, followers of Jesus who are are fairly new to a new faith. The book of Romans was written in the mid-50s. So you're barely two and a half decades out of the, the ministry of Jesus when, when uh, Gen Jesus was on earth ministering, teaching, and all those things. And so Paul writes this in the mid-50s, and you only have a couple decades uh, where they're finding out and trying to figure out what this means to, to follow Jesus as a Jew. And at the same time, Gentiles are also coming into and being drawn to the person of Jesus. And they're forming this ecclesia, this fellowship called the church, which brings in these two groups of people that historically have stood uh, against each other in, in opposition to one another. And so while Jews consider eating kosher a specific way of eating uh, holy or as an expression of their faithfulness to God or uh, their participation in the Sabbath as a way of their expression of faithfulness to God, the Gentiles don't have this. They might be familiar with some of those Jewish customs, but for them, eating meat, uh, eating, eating meat that was sacrificed to idols was something that was normal. And, and so what does it look like for them who are now entering into fellowship with Jewish brothers and sisters, what's it look like for them? And Acts 15 has a lot of, of, of this wrestling. Um, and really, Acts 15 makes it pretty simple. But you can imagine these two groups of people coming together and one saying, well, this is how I express my, my faith in Jesus. And this Gentile group saying, well, Kosher has really no meaning to me, and Sabbath really has no meaning to me either. And so this is how I am expressing my faith in Jesus. And so these two things coming together, and, and it's incredibly complex. You know, who's right? Who's right, or is there a right? Um, and this doesn't take too much imagination to uh, translate to how this is significant and, and applies to our times. Because we have our own groupings of people to, today, too. It's not just Jews and Gentiles, and so those would have been the two separate groups of people. And, and there probably were certainly more categories, because there were categories within Judaism. Judaism had the Essenes, they had the Zealots, they had the Pharisees, and so on, Sadducees. Um, the Gentiles came from all different cultures uh, throughout the European world, um, and and. and so there are a lot of subgroupings in order in the main groupings, but we have those groupings too, right? Uh, within the context of our ecclesia, our fellowship, and what we're trying to do uh, in terms of following Jesus as the people of God. And, and what we've done over the years is, you know, we, we separate, you know, we come to a point of disagreement, we separate, we come to another point of disagreement, we separate. And, and this is largely how we've gotten denominations where we've separated on non-essential issues. Uh, while remaining fairly united on, on essential issues. But we have groups, you know, you have fundamentalists, you have progressives, you have liberals, you have conservatives, you have Armenians, you have Calvinists, you have the high church, you have low church, you have denominations, you have non-denominational or independents. Uh, you, and, and, and we can't ignore in our day, too, that a lot of churches, either church to church or within a church, are divided upon uh, political lines in the United States Democrat and Republican. And so these are philosophical kinds of levels of division that we have within the church or levels of separation that we have within the church. But then there's practical, practical levels that we're separated to it, way, ways that we express ourselves. So those are more philosophical, but we have folks who really like uh, to go to a church that's expository in nature. And so you go verse by verse by verse. That's not what I'm doing. I preach more in a narrative form or I share it more in a narrative form. You have the, the age-old battle of hymns versus contemporary music. You have band or piano. You have loud or quiet. You have reserved or expressive. You have highly programmed or simple church structures. You, uh, you have seeker-sensitive move, movements. 
Um, you have praying in tongues, you have praying in, in quiet. And, and so these are more practical questions, you know, how we express our faith and practice our, our, our faith in Jesus. Um, so the, the challenge that the church has faced historically, and certainly now, is when we find ourselves within one of these groups of people, it's very easy for us to look at a group of people who is practicing or expressing faith in Christ in a different way, it's very easy for us to look at them judgmentally, judgmentally, as the weaker. And Paul uses this language of weak and strong here. Let's go back to verses 2 and 3 and look at this. Um, he writes, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. God has accepted them. And we might by extension say, okay, well, if God is accepting them, then it is also our calling as brothers and sisters under the authority and lordship of, of Jesus to also accept one another. Um, now, if you would parse these verses out in verses 2 or 3, kind of linearly, it might seem like Paul is saying that the Jewish Christians were weak because of their kosher diet, because they re didn't eat. And the Gentile Christians were strong because they could eat whatever they wanted. And we could also translate this into to modern times, too, and say that those who refrain, right, those who refrain are weak, and those who do not refrain uh, are, are strong. But nothing really could be further that, from the truth than that. The strength of, of someone's faith is not determined by their practice. Practice might be an outflow or an expression of, of faith, obviously. But uh, the strength of someone's faith isn't determined by what they do or, or don't do. Um, Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, that faith is sure of, being, uh, of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. What we hope for and what we do not see, it, it's not heaven, okay? It's God. It's God. It is union and fellowship and relationship with God. So it's not having faith in heaven. It's not believing that there is a heaven. But uh, and, and in Hebrews chapter 11, one of the main characters there is Abraham, who gives himself and his son fully because he is trusting in God. And so the orientation of faith is always God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Faith, then, is expressed by giving yourself fully to God. Faith is surrender to God. Faith is an ongoing and increasing orientation of your life and all of your life to God, to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, a Jew, or you or I, could abstain from something. So whether it be food or whether it be setting aside a holy day, what a, <laughs> going back to my college days, abstain, you know, I broke my CDs, my secular CDs only to buy them again. Um, we could abstain from something or not do something. And that is not an expression of strength because it wouldn't necessarily, it, it might have little or nothing to do with surrendering to God. It might have everything to do with earning our worth or approval or fitting in with others who are saying, well, this is the way that you must practice it. Uh, it doing those things might simply um, be an expression that really has more to do with us than to do with God. And so abstaining from something really doesn't show surrender because you could be doing it for all the wrong reasons. Likewise, on the other hand, a Gentile, or you and I again, could participate in a wider variety of things. We could see every day is holy. We could think that church was in nature. What you know, whatever perspective that you might want to take that's a little more broader in nature. But that doesn't mean that it has anything to do with surrendering or orienting our lives to God either. It might simply be our attempt to define God 
in a way that is convenient to us or it meets with our desires. And it really has nothing to do with surrender or submission or orienting the whole of our lives to God. And so all this is is to say that strong and weak are not dependent upon a group of people or or how the different groups of people practice their faith. Strength and weakness, the way that Paul's referring to it, has nothing to do with that. Gentile Christian, Jewish Christians really ought to be the strong ones because they have the historicity. If you're thinking about uh, faith being defined by practice, Gentiles are just learning how to do this thing. Um, so it really doesn't have to do with practice, but faith, uh, uh, biblical faith is, is, is surrender to God, a reorienting and an orienting of our whole self, our whole life to God. That is faith. And then that finds expression. Certainly, it always has practical ways to find its expression, but we can never determine strength or weakness of faith by simple, simple observance. By simple observance. Because those, those things, in some ways, are matters of the heart, and we just simply can't get to that with one another, And which is, is simply another reason, too. Paul is, is saying you can't judge one another. You just simply can't judge one another. Let me just talk a little bit more about faith for a minute or two, uh, because faith is dynamic. Faith is dynamic in nature, means meaning that it changes. Um, I'm hopeful that anyone who follows Jesus uh, can uh, attest to this or can affirm this, because if faith is surrendering to God or orienting ourselves more and more to God or finding ourselves more and more within the fellowship of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. So faith is more finding our life within the life of God. Then it ought to grow over time. It ought to grow over time. Um, and, and this is why Paul's warning to us against judgment is so important. Because when we judge, we are judging from our particular experience of faith without an understanding of the other person's posture of surrender and orientation to God. We simply don't know. We simply don't know. Paul says in verse 4, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. The Lord is able to make them stand. A positive expression, uh, expression of faith for someone might not hold meaning for another, and that's okay. The worst thing that we can do as brothers and sisters in Christ is demand that another's experience or expression uh, of faith is the same as ours. Instead, what we want to do is to honor one another and to, to learn from one another. Um, I don't know about you, but... The way that I've grown in my faith over, and I've been in church for I probably since birth, so I'm 42 years old. Um, and whether I, I was fully participating or just kind of showing up, I don't know. But I know that over these 42 years, um, my faith has been caught rather than taught. Uh, and, and, and let me explain that. Um, over the years, I have learned from Mennonites, Brethren in Christ, Charismatic, Reformed, uh, Catholic, Contemplative, and Quaker brothers and sisters in Christ and teachers. Uh, all of those traditions have influenced me in some way, have taught me something about God. And it's not just the traditions, uh, because that's too high of a level. It's, it's people. It's people. Uh, um, let me just, I'll, I'll go back through. Mennonite, um, and this isn't name dropping because you don't know <laughs> these people, really. But I, I, I share names to just share that it's not just traditions, but it's people that have demonstrated faith to, like, I learned surrender to Christ as I observed their surrender. And so my Mennonite brother, Marcus Smucker, who was a mentor for me, there's been countless people in the Brethren in Christ Church, um, Terry Brensinger, John Hallbecker, Doug Kelschner, um, 
yeah, in, in, the, in the charismatic movement, I had a whole host of people at Lee University who were just um, a gift to me. My Reformed Seminary and the professors uh, that I had there, uh, the Catholic tradition, simply the Catholic tradition, the, the, some of the folks who are at the Jesuit Center and operate, uh, operate that, um, the contemplative and Quaker traditions, Mary Kate Morse, uh, and, and, uh, Deborah Lloyd Cohen. And there, there are just people and, and there are countless people. And if I haven't mentioned you and you're actually watching this, I'm sorry. Um, this is just kind of off the cuff. Some of the folks who have influenced me a ton, um, but I've learned by observing their faith. I, I, I've learned, surrendered to God by observing my wife's faith. I've learned to honor um, what God is doing in my children. And I can't base what God is or is not doing just based on what I see or what I don't see. And I think that's where the judgmentalism comes in, is we we judge on what we see or what we don't see or what we hear or we don't hear um, or, or what we think we should hear and we don't hear. And judgment comes out of that. And it's one of the most detrimental things that, that we do to one another in the body of Christ. Um, and, and this is a time and this is a season when the very last thing that we, we need to do is, is tear one another down. The things that need to be torn down, I think, in this season of, of humanity uh, and this season of the church are, are the walls, the walls of judgment that we've created between one another uh, because we need one another, I think, now more than ever. Returning to the, the earlier story, just, you know, and, and I hope you've experienced this too, but the sweetness and the beauty of just simply being with followers of Jesus that are in your corner and that are bringing you to the Lord um, is probably the most sustaining experience of um i i don't know it's it's simply a sustaining experience like no other like absolutely no other paul says this in in verses seven and eight he says for none of us lives to ourselves alone none of us dies for ourselves alone if we live we live for the lord and if we die we die for the lord so whether we live or die we belong to the lord we belong to the Lord. And uh, that idea of, of belonging to the Lord has been very helpful for me over the, I would say, at least the last month or so. Um, I've seen Christian leaders whom I've disagreed with have fallen, and instead of rejoicing, I, I've just been sad. Um, because I believe that they belong to the Lord, too. I believe they belong to the Lord, too. And there are other brothers and sisters in Christ who are expressing things that I simply don't agree with. But beyond that, I believe that they belong to the Lord. And and really, friends, like we can choose where to place our focus. I mean, uh, this disagreement that we have with one another or any disagreements that we can have one another as brothers and sisters in Christ ultimately happen underneath the umbrella of the Lordship of Jesus. So all of those things, all of those differences are surrendered and submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. We're not God. William Greenway uh, writes this wonderful, and I think helpful little quote. He says, Paul is not negating. Okay, so there's not any negation here of political, doctrinal, or moral realities. But, Greenway writes, he disarms the finality of all such judgments by reminding us that they are not ultimate. That first and last we stand not because we were in the right, but because by God's grace we are the Lord's. Just read that last part one more time. That first and last we stand not because we were in the right, 
but because God's by God's grace we are the Lord's. That I think describes a, a wonderful that's that's a wonderful description of a strong faith. When we realize that the only way that we're standing is by the grace of the Lord. Not because we're right. Not because we're doing things right. I mean, I think that's true surrender. Is when we say, God, the only reason that I'm standing is because you're giving me the grace to stand. So friends, I would, I would encourage us, um, because we're, we're in a time and a season, I think, where the larger culture, and this, this is certainly true within the church too, where we begin with our differences. And when we begin with our differences, we actually miss the Christ who is both dwelling within us as brothers and sisters in Christ and who is Lord over us, all of us. And just like verse 12 says, because we are in, in the end, we are all accountable to God. In the end, that is the greater and that is the, the ultimate reality. And this is what Paul, I think, is calling us to in this passage, is surrendering to the lordship of Christ and surrendering one another to the lordship of Christ and surrendering our judgments of one another to the lordship of Christ. We're going to enter into a, a time of just receiving communion. And so if you have your elements of bread and juice or bread and wine, if you want to get those things, um, we're going to receive together. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 talks about how Jesus made peace between Jew and Gentile, be, made peace between the two by his blood shed on the cross. Every time we come to the table, um, we are reminded that, that the work of Christ on the cross brings us together. Uh, and it is an act of surrender, surrendering to Christ and really surrendering to, to one another uh, to come to the table together. And so as we take the, the bread and the wine today, as we take the body and the blood of Christ, it is the body and the blood of Christ that has made peace, that has made peace. And, and I pray, I pray that for, for the church. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it. And he said, this, this, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I pray that you would help us to view one another, particularly those that we might disagree with or have different opinions with, who are brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, that you would help us to see that each one of us belong to the Lord. And that is the ultimate reality. That's the ultimate lens that we see things through. God, we repent of our judgments, which are frequent and constant. We repent of participating in the judgmentalism of the world. God, and we pray that you would help us to see one another as belonging to you. And we pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's good to be with you today. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. Um, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord bring you peace. God bless. Love you all. Bye-bye.